So monitor lizards are becoming more and more popular all the time in herpetoculture. And I really love doing a lot of monitor lizard videos because, well, I love monitors. And while I'm down here in Florida, there's only one guy that I can think of to do a monitor episode with, and that is Ron St. Pierre. Ron works with some of the most really incredible monitor species. Some monitor species that very few other people are currently working with. So in this video, I'm gonna meet with Ron and we are gonna meet some of his incredible monitor lizards and get some tips and techniques on how to breed them, feed them, and care for them. I'm Dave Kaufman and these are my reptile adventures. At Zilla, we are dedicated to the innovation of caging, lighting, and equipment solutions that provide proper husbandry for your pet's long and happy life. To see our entire catalog, visit ZillaRules.com. This is Ron St. Pierre. You have been uh, a staple in the reptile world for many, many years. You've worked with tons of different species. You currently work with tons of different species, but in this video, we're gonna concentrate on your monitors. Last time I was out here, we filmed a lot of cool stuff and kind of breezed over the monitors. And in this video, I wanna concentrate and show off the incredible monitors that you're working with. And you are working with some monitor species that maybe a handful of people are actually working with. Yeah, right now, currently, yeah. That's, that's the stuff that I'm kind of focused on. So how long have you been working with monitors? Monitors? Um, since 1990-ish. Okay, so 30 Eight, some odd 90, years. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah, the, first, the first monitors I ever bred were uh, crocodile monitors back in the mid-90s. And uh, a lot of white throats, a lot of dwarf monitors over the years, flavies, stuff like that. All right, so in this closure, we have one of my favorite monitors, the Merton's Water Monitor. And uh, what are we feeding them there? Oh, um, thawed chicks. Look at them. They're all lined up. Yeah. Hey, except for you guys over there. Um, you guys can come over. So the last time that I was here filming your monitors, the weather was exactly like this and nobody came out. Yep. Now I'm back to film this follow-up video. Yep. And the weather is overcast and nobody's coming out. Look at how sluggish these guys are. Yeah, it's just not hot enough. Yeah. That's why they're on the black mat. Right. The black mat will get 200 degrees and they're waiting for it to, for the sun to come out. Yeah, I don't know that I've ever seen a monitor take this much time at food and then refuse it. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right, so in this enclosure is what I really want to focus this video on. These are incredible monitors and what, maybe a handful of people in this country are working with these? Yeah, yeah, these are Spencer's Goannas. There's females right there, right there. Now I met this guy last time because of his little bum tail there. Mm -hmm. Nope, <laughs> camera is not a chick. There you go. Perpetually hungry. Yeah. There's one male and three females in this enclosure. So last time uh, I was here, we were talking about these and you know, in that last video, I wanted to show really everything that you have here, but this one, I'm obviously going to focus on the monitors, but right. last time we were talking and you know, these are desert monitors yeah. found in the outback of Australia. Correct. We're here in Florida where it's hot and humid. Yep. How are you uh, finding that working with them in an outdoor enclosure in this environment is working for you? I mean, I was breeding bearded dragons outdoors here for 30 years. Basically what we do is we make sure that at least half of the enclosures are permanently dry and that's why these guys have the clear panels. Um, they actually, we use shaded panels so that very end is always cool and this, the uh, clear panels amplify the heat. So they can go and get really ridiculously hot. And then depending on how much rain we get, sometimes if we're going through periods where there's a lot of rain, we'll cover 90% of the enclosure. Um, and that as long as you keep the rain off of them, the actual air humidity is not an issue at all. So it's it's really about getting wet too often. Right. So if you keep them dry, um, then there's not an issue. All right, so we got a small male over here. There you go, shithead. <laughs> <laughs> and drags it back under. This is a Juvie Spencer's, and how old is this one? Uh, this one's right about two years old, and it's a male. It's produced by Don Church. And uh, this, is, this is gonna be hopefully our superstar male breeder this year. So how long have you uh, been working with Spencer's? Uh, this will be the second year that they've been here. All right, so everybody wants to know, how much does the Spencer's monitor cost? 
initially they were around 20 grand a pop right i think the ones sold recently were sold for less than that but i'm not sure um so yeah i mean they're they're definitely one of the more expensive uh, absolutely projects out there they're still they're still very relatively rare but hopefully that'll change so that makes these guys one of the most expensive monitors that you can own I believe so, yeah. The good thing is they don't they don't bite. I've never been bitten by one. It's all threat. Right. So when it comes to your breeding program for monitors, uh, obviously you've bred lace monitors and, you know, yeah, a, a lot of other monitor species. Right. You know, what does it take to breed a Spencer's monitor? Um, and how does that differ from breeding laces and other goannas? Yeah, I mean, these guys seem to be a little more... Uh, you get it doesn't look like they can multi-clutch like a lot of them it looks like you get one shot a year and it appears to happen in the winter time gotcha i suspect it's probably uh they're different i mean it, who knows it, it may be possible these may under the right conditions multi-clutch but we have been unable to get anything out of them so far we got one clutch of infertile eggs this year but that was a female that had never been with a male so i'm hoping that uh that this coming season we're gonna you know hibernate these guys and hopefully they'll go yep so you do give them a cycle oh yeah Every, I, everything here has it's basically on the florida cycle and that's another thing is it takes a couple years most of these animals came from up north so they were on a different cycle it usually takes two to three years to get animals onto the cycle that you're currently in right um so i i really think that our first real shot is going to be this season so so if you're going to be working with monitors, you got to be in it for the long game. Yeah, it, they, the monitors are a long game, for sure. It's a big pair of black throats. Look at these chubsters. Um, we're trying to streamline down to less species, so this is something we only have a pair of. It's possible that female may be gravid. That's kind of what I'm waiting on. Man, these guys are massive. Yeah. So this one right here, if you can see the <laughs> scale here, that guy's at least six feet long. Yeah, he's a monster. So this one is the female, yeah. and she might be gravid. She's looking a little thick there. You can definitely see the size difference from the male there. How many eggs does a monitor that size lay? Um, well, I have a lot of. I have less experience with this particular uh, species than I do the, a similar the um, white throat. But I've had those lay up to 65 eggs. 65. Yeah, and they can do that every two months or so. 65 eggs every two months or so. Yeah. So before I turn on the camera, we were talking about that there are no commercial monitor breeding facilities out there. No. And when you have an animal that lays 65 eggs every couple of months, it kind of raises the question, why aren't there? And there is an answer for that. But from my own experience, every time I've, I've been attempting to do those commercially, various species over the years, um, once you get over a certain number, it just seems like there's a, a steep decline in fertility and, and animals getting gravid. Just the whole process just seems to kind of grind to a halt. So my personal feeling is there's some sort of nature, nature has a mechanism there, whether it's some pheromones or something um, that basically says, okay, there's enough apex predators in this general area, you need to slow down or stop. There's a few factors, but I, but I tend to think that more often than not, it seems like like that's the issue and it's been attempted by other people and there's no no one outside of water monitors um, there is none of the giant predatory lizards um, that have been done on a very large scale successfully for any any period of time well that's a phd paper waiting to be written right, right there. yeah cool yeah, somebody with a much higher pay grade than <laughs> right <mine. laughs> we'll have to figure that one out right all right so spencers we've got mertens we've got the black throats lace and now we're gonna go see my favorites. Yeah, it's mine too. Yeah, so these are, it's a Bell's Phase lace. This is one of our males. And he's probably very hungry by now. Yeah, he's clearly very hungry. Yeah, here he comes. Woo! Yeah. So this is one of the males, and I met this guy last time I was here. Yep. So these are farm-raised chicks that are uh, humanely euthanized, bred especially for reptile food. So how many lace monitors do you currently have here? Uh, seven. Four, seven? 4.3, yeah. And how many bells out of those? Um, four bells, three what would be called normal phase. Right, these, right. This is a pair of normal phase animals in this enclosure that um, have recently uh, recently laid eggs. That female right there is gravid right now. Oh, nice. Man, there is nothing like a lace monitor. Yeah, they're definitely my favorite. 
The only monitor bite I've ever taken from a wild monitor lizard. You got bit by one of oh, these? Oh yeah, and it was hysterical. All right, look at this big, beautiful. Ah, I am getting nailed by a lacy monitor. After I got bit, all my friends from Australia that I was with thought that we were going to spend the rest of my time in a hospital. Oh, it stings. That is gonna leave one hell of a mark. There is no way that I'm going to, you know, spend any of my Australian herping time in a hospital. <laughs> I mean, my hand would have to be dangling off my wrist in order for me to say, okay, maybe we should stop. Spoken like a true herper. That's right. Or an idiot, one or the other. Yeah. <laughs> all right, so we got another Bells in here. This one's a little younger. All right, so explain why we have the vertical plastic there in this enclosure. So in order to do Australian stuff outside, we have to get them hotter than they would. It do just doesn't get hot enough here. And what that does is it provides the whole tops and everything. This shields them from excessive rain, but that amplifies the heat. So if they want to get 200 and some degrees, they can just go behind that. And in that little section over there, it gets so hot that, that and that's what I had to do to get it. I couldn't get them to breed out here. Sure. Um, because every day they would get up to a certain temperature, then it would rain and then it would screw them up. So just having a piece of vertical plastic in these enclosures creates thermal regulation. Yeah, that's basically what it is. It's, it's thermal regulation. Actually, that's pretty ingenious. I don't know that I would have come up with that. All right, so moving around the corner here, this is another beautiful Bell's phase. Yeah, this, this one actually was a baby until very recent. This one's less right at about a year and a half old. Yeah, she still has those bold colorations on her. <laughs> he slid into home. I seriously don't know anybody who doesn't love a Bell's Phase monitor, and I don't want to know the person that doesn't love a Bell's Phase lace monitor. And the cool thing about them is that they carry that pattern into adulthood. It's not like, yep. I mean, wouldn't that just be terrible if they were like ringed pythons, for instance, and they just turned into yep. black animals as they grew older? Or, yep. I love how they keep that into adulthood. There you go. Girl. Yeah, he's he's really taming. He's he's actually. Look at that, he's got a mouthful of food and you just reached in and repositioned him. What other monitor species can you do that with? Yeah, I mean, uh, that's one of the things I like about these guys. They're, they're really tame for the most part and they're trustworthy because they're very smart. I don't think people really take to, into consideration how smart these guys are. Yeah. So today we're feeding them chicks, but these guys get a pretty varied diet here. They get a lot of st different stuff. Um, we give them a lot of boiled, hard-boiled eggs. We mm -hmm. give them rodents. The bulk of their diet is the chicks. Right. The chicks are the most economical, and they seem to be the easiest for these guys to digest. Well, they certainly love them. What advice would a veteran like you have for somebody that's just getting into monitors or that's been doing it for a year or two? And what advice would you have for them as they kind of look into keeping more, breeding more, that sort of thing? I think the main thing is to not overextend yourself. When it comes to monitors, they, they all have fairly large requirements as far as caging and food requirements and stuff. And with these guys, they require a fair amount of commitment. So yeah, I mean, start small. Smaller species or water monitors are good to start with. You know, if you want something bigger, don't be afraid to spend the money on the enclosures. That's a big deal. The enclosure needs to be good, strong, offer lots of different zones for uh, thermal regulation, the ability to get cool, ability to get super hot, the ability to get in between those two spectrums. I mean, this applies to all reptile species, but it's particularly important with monitors is to give them choices, lots and lots of choices. The more choices you give them, the more success you'll have. So everything here is designed in a way to give them, you know, to take advantage of what Florida offers and give them the ability to have a range of choices. So it's just not as simple as throwing them in a box. Yeah, absolutely. So you have all these cages with this welded wire here and you know, a lot of keepers may try chicken wire or something no. like that. And that's not a good no. uh, material to use for a monitor, uh, for an outdoor monitor cage. Even for an indoor. I mean, the thing is with monitors is you don't want them to be able to get out and your construct if it's for the larger species of construction needs to be sturdy and so one place that i have seen people make mistakes on is to try to get by with you know uh, wire you can pick up at any hardware store generally and 
most of that is not suitable. We use 16 gauge vinyl coated welded wire for all the large species and then it's attached with a double mechanism. We use um, these long industrial staples initially and then we come back over and put either a screw with a nut to back it up as a secondary or we use the actual wood itself to sandwich the wire. So that way you have two, two ways that that wire connections can't fail. Gotcha. And uh, because you can't have, you know, obviously I'm in Florida, I can't have stuff loose. So it's part of the responsibility factor that you have when you take on the responsibility of working with large species. Um, the last thing you want is your neighbor to come home and find one in their house, in their yard. Right. Now, are these built into the ground to keep them from digging out of the enclosure? The enclosures are fully enclosed. They're built and then they're sat. So they're the same thing that's on the top, which is welded wire sandwiched with wood, is on the bottom. And then I, every month or so I go through and check it all, make sure that, because the wood that's on the ground has a tendency to rot first. So you look and make sure that everything's good. If there's a problem, then we cut it and replace it and fix it. And then maybe four or five years into the process, you end up having to replace the bottoms, sometimes other pieces, but it's pretty, it's, it, it lasts a pretty good while. Well, fantastic. So, Ron, thank you again for having me over yep. once again. You know, last time again, we showed so many of the reptiles that you work with in this video. Again, I wanted to just kind of concentrate on the monitors, your care, how you uh, breed them, the enclosure build. Yep. Um, I think you've given a lot of people a lot of really great information and a lot of really good ideas on how to keep monitor lizards. So, again, man, thank you so much for having me over. I'm gonna turn off this camera and let's just go play with these guys. <laughs> <laughs> so guys, every time I'm down in Florida, I really try to get over here to Ron and Heather's place. We just filmed a really cool Bearded Dragon episode with Heather. And guys, I just wanna give a real quick shout out and thank you to all my Patreon supporters. If you would like to become a Patreon of this channel and get early access to videos, discounts on merch, and so much more, please check out my Patreon. That link is in the description below as well. And guys, thanks for watching and until the next reptile adventure, love the planet, feed your reptile obsession, and rattle on.